Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. John Kelly here, and welcome. Welcome to our new series, the special edition series on Viewer's Choice. We asked you what you wanted to see, and you answered. You told us. You gave us a lot of choices on various high-profile unsolved murders from around the world. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to try and answer your questions and give you various special editions on these different murders. Today, we're focusing on Jack the Ripper. Yep, ages old Jack the Ripper. Nobody knows who he was, and we're gonna focus on the women he killed. He killed five women that we're gonna focus on today, probably killed more, but we're gonna focus on the five that we think we can gleam a profile of him on in Whitechapel, London in 1888. The first woman I want to talk about is Mary Ann Nichols. Now, Mary Ann Nichols, like the other women, had her throat cut, but didn't have any organs removed. There was a cut in her abdomen, but nothing was removed. Now, as you know, with serial killers, the most important thing is to try and find their early victims, because serial killers make their mistakes with earlier victims. So when we see his first victim, we have to focus on what he did and how he killed her. Now he cut her throat, but what he did is he sliced one side of the throat and then he sliced the other side of the throat. So what I'm thinking is he focused on cutting her carotid arteries. And also, when you think about cutting throats, what does that do? It silences the victim almost immediately. Now, you have to ask yourself, where did he learn this? Maybe some of you know a quote I have out there, you only know what you know from what you've learned, who are your teachers. See, these serial killers learn their craft somewhere. And as we have the Golden State Killer coming in with the flashlight and the pistol or the flashlight in the eyes and the knife, where did he learn that? He learned that from being a cop, from what we understand. So the bottom line is these people usually have learned their skill somewhere. And I've got to believe back in that day, with the cuts on the arteries in the beginning, I have to believe that he worked for some kind of butchering company, some kind of slaughterhouse where he learned his trade. And his trade was cutting the animals necks, cutting their carotid arteries to get them to bleed out as quick as possible, to send them for processing, and to move on to the next one. Because don't forget, it's all about in a slaughterhouse, it's all about quantity, you know, slaughtering as many animals as you can in a day's time, especially back in 1888. Now also, we have to look at a second victim too. Second victim here, we're talking about Annie Chapman. Now, we're gonna see him start to evolve. With Annie Chapman, he sliced her throat on both sides as well, but then completely opened up her abdomen and removed her uterus. Okay, so we can see him evolving. In the first murder, he murders victim number one. He slices on both sides of the throat, which I'm believing is the carotid arteries. And then he starts to open up the abdomen, but he can't go all the way for whatever the reason is. On the second victim, he evolves and he goes all the way. And he opens up uh, Andy Chapman's abdomen and he takes out her uterus. Completely removed her uterus. Now we go to victim number three. Victim number three is Elizabeth Stride. Her throat is sliced on the left side. There's no mutilation. And people aren't sure if he did this job or not. They're not sure if he killed her or not. I believe he did, and, and, and as other people believe as well, 
that he was hurried in the attack. Somebody was coming around a corner, a witness of some sort, but something scared him or somebody scared him and he took off. You know, when we're looking at victim number four, which is very interesting, we're looking at Catherine Edows. Supposedly, Catherine's throat was sliced completely. Now, we could see the evolution here. We can see the progression because he's just not cutting on the left side or the right side. Now he's progressed to Catherine where he has severed her throat completely. I guess he figured out that he's much stronger than these women and he is able to slice their throat in one slice completely and sever both carotid arteries at the same time. That way, it's quicker for him to shut them up so they can't scream. Plus, he has complete control and dominance because he's cut their throat and they're bleeding out. They're bleeding to death. And it's a terrible way to go. And they can't scream. They're suffocating in their own blood. They're bleeding out. And at that point in time, he's going to work on them and he's you know, trying to remove different organs. Now with Catherine, he cut open her uh, body and he removed her kidney. Um, now this is very important because he also removed a major part of her uterus. What he did is he took that kidney, supposedly and took half of that kidney and he sent it off to the Vigilance Committee, uh, to a gentleman by the name of Mr. Lusk. And he sent that kidney with the letter. And they call it the letter from hell. And in that letter, he tells Mr. Lusk that he's going to continue to kill, that he can't stop killing. But also, he's sending Mr. Lusk proof. He's sending Mr. Lusk half the kidney. And he had the kidney actually in ice to preserve it, to give it enough time to get to Mr. Lusk, who again was the head of the vigilance committee that was pretty much on the streets and trying to catch the Ripper at the time he was uh, carrying on. So now we have to ask ourselves a little bit more about this guy. I mean, we've got a guy that's progressing. We've got a killer that's progressing. And he's actually becoming better at his trade. He's killing better. He's killing quicker. He's killing faster. And he's evolving. And he's taking more organs. Now he's taking a kidney. Now he's taking a uterus. And he wants to be known for what he's doing. So he's sending half of this kidney off to the Vigilance Committee of Mr. Lusk. So they're going to give it to the papers and he's going to have his 15 minutes of fame and he's going to eat the other half of the kidney. That's what was in the letter from hell. All right. So now we see the escalation going on here. Now the other victim and the last victim we're going to focus on is Mary Jane Kelly. And I have to tell you, I don't think there's any relation here. So with that being said, we're going to look at the most gruesome crime scene that the Ripper committed in Whitechapel. And with Mary Jane Kelly, he sliced her throat completely to her spine. One slice right across. He's getting stronger. He's having more confidence in himself. He's more evolved. So he cuts her throat completely across her spine and then opens up her abdomen and almost empties the abdomen of all her organs. I mean, even the heart was missing, along with the uterus and other organs. So now with Mary Jane Kelly being extremely mutilated, and I must tell you that she is not found on the street. She is found in her room. So she either let this guy into her room or 
this guy, uh, you know, just snuck in on her or broke in on her or whatever. But what that tells us is this guy was watching her or this guy knew her in some way. And this guy maybe just approached her on the street and maybe, you know, she just took all her Johns, you know, to her apartment. So we want to look at this and we want to keep, keep mind and keep focused on the evolution and the progression of this serial killer. Now we have to get to the profile. I mean, that's the most important part of this for us. We've got to take a look at what we can do to profile this individual. And the profile we're going to do is a pretty generic profile. However, we're going to leave it up to you guys to see who you want to connect it to, who you think might fit this profile. Because all of you out there who have followed this case and are very interested in this case have your own favorite people of interest. So we're just going to give you our take and then it's going to be up to you. What I will tell you is that a few days ago, I saw where they were now saying that a woman could be Jack the Ripper. Well, I have to tell you, I have a real problem with that. And there's no way in the world that I believe a woman was Jack the Ripper. I really don't believe that. I really believe that this took a strong person to overtake these women. I don't know if you really understand street hardened prostitutes. They are a tough breed. And, you know, they've kicked plenty of asses and they've kicked and beat up a lot of men. So I don't think a woman could overtake them. I think it would have to be a strong man who was coming. With that being said, what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with a sadistic, cannibalistic serial killer, very similar to a Jeffrey Dahmer. We're looking at a serial killer that really knew the area. I mean, this guy was extremely familiar with the area and if you think about it, nobody really saw who he was. Some people claim they saw somebody escaping, but nobody really got a real look at him and could do a really good composite sketch of him. So he was very familiar with the area. He knew where to attack the girls. He knew where to bring the girls. And he knew where, uh, you know, it was an isolated situation. He could take a victim to a certain place and not worry about being identified. And he pulled it off. At least with these five people, he pulled it off. So now we also have to take a look at, we have somebody that's very familiar with the area. And I have to believe we have somebody that has a history of killing animals. I believe that's how he started. Not unlike serial killers of today, they start off being cruel to animals and killing animals. One serial killer told me, I think I mentioned it before, by killing smaller animals, you work your way up to killing bigger animals, like human beings. I believe this guy was very involved with killing animals. I believe he made a living killing animals, whether on a farm, whether in a slaughterhouse. I mean, I have to believe that this bloodletting took place somewhere else besides on the streets of Whitechapel. You do not become that familiar with blood and you do not become that desensitized to working with blood and cutting people up unless you've done it before on animals. And I'll go back to the beginning when there was a slit on both sides of the throat instead of cutting the complete throat. And those are on the uh, first victims in uh, Whitechapel. Now, the next thing we want to look at, we want to think about this guy's acting very violent around prostitutes. He's killing them. So sometimes, and, and normally a person doesn't go directly to that point. They work their way up. They start off by abusing women 
and then they work their way up to murder. So they start off progressing with their physical violence. And I have to believe that that's what this guy did. I have to believe that he was known for having altercations with prostitutes before he ended up becoming a serial killer. Very similar to Gary Ridgway, who got arrested for beating up a prostitute and choking a prostitute years before he started killing prostitutes and became the Green River Killer. The other thing I want to focus on is that he had to be well known to the girls. As we've talked about in all these cases, you know, every one of these guys, Gary Ridgewood, Joel Rifkin, who was ever involved with prostitute murders, habituated with prostitutes. They were always there, they were always around, they were always available in their spare time to hang around with prostitutes. But they didn't kill all the time. And they didn't kill every prostitute that they went out with. And I believe Jack the Ripper is no different. I don't believe he killed every prostitute he went out with. I believe he progressed to this point. He progressed to this fetish of necrophilia and, and, and having the dead within him by being a cannibal and having dead parts with him and being close to the dead. I believe that just progressed as he evolved into this sadistic, cannibalistic serial killer. Because that's how this stuff goes. And it's the fantasy that we've talked about. The fantasy continues to grow. So the predator's actions continue to progress. So I have to believe that, you know, you'll, you'll know that hopefully someday we'll find out that there were other women somehow that were connected to this guy from the streets. He probably went on to kill other women and change his MO in some way. Then we have the usual suspects. I mean, again, there's so many people of interest and everybody has their own person of interest that's been really involved and obsessed with this case over the years. But the usual suspects always pop up. And we don't have as many these days as you have on the Jack the Ripper case, but they still pop up. And the way you eliminate the suspects is to go out and investigate them and try to prove them innocent. If you try to prove them innocent, you won't be able to if they're the killer. The case will only get stronger against them. And eventually, you'll be able to indict them and arrest them. So I have to believe that uh, he was involved with other prostitutes back in those days. Probably never hear anything about it because it's so old. But, um, you know, he, he just didn't kill the first five women that he went out with. And I don't think he stopped killing after those five. I think things got pretty hot for him uh, in the Whitechapel section of London. And he decided to get out of there. The other thing is looking at his primary intake senses, and that's what we do whenever we profile a serial killer. We look at, you know, what is their primary intake sense? I'm saying primary intake sense. I have to believe that this guy's primary intake sense was visual. This is a very visually oriented serial killer, which most serial killers are. They're extremely visually oriented because he knew where to find this particular victim. He had scoped them out. He knew exactly where to take them. He had scoped the area out. They do that. He knew where nobody else would be looking. He knew where there would be no witnesses. He knew exactly what he was going to do and what he was after. He was after murdering them, but his fetish was with their organs, the organs of a dead woman. And then he was so visual that he decided to take an object, which was a body part, a kidney, cut it in half, and send half of it to Mr. Lusk at the Vigilance Committee, and send him a nice letter. See, this is all visually oriented behavior. So that's why I mean his primary intake sense was visual. Very visually oriented guy. Secondly, I want to know if this guy was 
options oriented or if he was structured? I mean, is this guy just looking for a victim of opportunity? Does he just run into these people? Or is he structured? Is there a structure to this guy? Is he methodical, like the Golden State Killer? Bottom line, sure is. I mean, this guy focused on a certain type of woman, took her to a certain place, knew there wasn't going to be anybody there, had a structure where he would slit the throat first, structured again where he would open up the abdomen, structured again where he would take certain organs, and structured again where he would leave without anybody seeing him. So we have a visually structured serial killer that's a sadistic, psychopathic cannibal who is focused on sexually enjoying necrophilia. That is his fetish, necrophilia, and he wants to stalk them, kill them, take their organs, ingest them, keep them around him, the different body parts, and sleep with the dead. Another tip off is the bloodletting. Like I said, most serial killers are not comfortable with all this blood all over the place. Even back years ago when they didn't even know about DNA. So the bottom line here is, you know, is this somebody that was known to work in a slaughterhouse? Was this somebody that was known on the streets and by the girls as somebody who killed animals? And because of that, he would have traces of blood on him from his job. And he was known for that. So that way he wouldn't stand out or be conspicuous. Something else we have to ask ourselves. That's, that's certainly another good question that has to be answered. So anyway, that's where we're at for today. And that's part of our profile. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, hopefully for any of you that are really focused on Jack the Ripper, this can give you our insight, our take, and I uh, can help you with your uh, favorite person of interest. For sure, we know there's a lot out there. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for your support. We're going to do more of this on high-profile cases, old ones, newer ones. Make it a great day out there and stay safe.